Hello, advanced social psychology students. So most of the weeks for this class, you are going to um, summarize an article. And some of the weeks you'll get to choose an article. There's one week where there's only one article and everyone in the class will um, summarize the same article. In addition to summarizing these articles, we're gonna discuss them using Harmonize. But the purpose of this short video is to discuss how I would like you to summarize the article. So I'm going to do the share so I can share the, um, the template that I'd like you to use. And you'll be able to see the template in um, the week one. Uh, there's a tab in the week one materials. So um, the first thing you're gonna do is put down the reference for the article. And I don't need for you to give me the entire um, APA reference, all I need are the author's names and the year that it was published. And I want you to um, put that on there, not only as an identifying factor, but also it'll remind you how, whether this is cutting edge or is it 10 years old or is, um, you know, like when was this published? So in each of the empirical articles that you're going to read, they follow the American Psychological Association, the APA style. So the articles will begin with the title and then there'll be an abstract of the article. Sometimes the abstract is like centered in the middle of the page, indented a lot. Sometimes um, there'll be an article that will have two columns and the abstract will be at the very beginning of the first column all in an italicized font, but it will be clear what the abstract is. The abstract is usually about 250 words and it summarizes the entire paper. After the abstract will be the introduction section. So in these APA papers, in the introduction section, the authors usually begin by trying to get you interested in the topic, draw you in, but then they will uh, let you know what their research question is. They'll let you know to some extent why they think this is important. Then they're gonna do a huge literature review. They're going to review all of the research that they could find that they believe is relevant to this topic. After the literature review, they'll usually have a sentence that says something like, so the purpose of this paper is, or the purpose of this study is, and they'll present their hypotheses, okay? At the end of the introduction section, and the introduction section is the only section that's not labeled. It won't say introduction. And to some extent, introduction is a little bit of a misnomer um, outside of APA style. When I think of an introduction, I think of something very short. The introduction is usually the longest part of the entire paper. So um, basically it's telling you why this research is important, what the purpose is of them doing it, what's happened before, like what research is our, what do we already know? And then a hypothesis in this study, what they hope to find or think they're going to find. Okay. After the introduction section, there'll be a section that will be labeled method. And oftentimes the method has three different sections. It will have a section called participants. In the participant section, it will tell you who participated in their study, how many people, any qualifying um, characteristics, anything, anything that the participants had to have in order to be qualified to participate in the study. It, they'll tell you like um, what percentage were men, what percentage of women. Um, uh, they oftentimes will talk about the average, I mean, the percentage of each race, their average age, things like that. Then there'll be a section called materials where they will talk about um, any survey that the people were given, the participants were given. They'll discuss um, how the survey was created, how valid it is, what kinds of questions are on it that kind of thing. And then lastly, it'll have the procedure. And in the procedure section, they tell you exactly what the participants had to do to participate in their study. They sort of walk you through what happened to the participants. And so after you read the method section, you have a really good idea of what all the participants had to go through in order to participate in the study, okay? Then comes the results section. And in the result results section, the authors will tell you the statistics that were run and the results based on those statistics. They don't give a lot of um, 
interpretation. It's very much like this particular um, analysis found, showed this, this analysis showed that. Um, if you are uh, basically when you guys go to read the results section, because you haven't had a lot of statistics, even if you've had our introduction to statistics in the behavioral sciences, most of the statistics that um, the authors are using are really complex and more than what you've learned in the in the one class you've had. Most of the people who are the authors of this had five, six, seven classes in graduate level classes in statistics. So um, don't expect to understand the results section super well, and that's okay. Um, then after that will become will come the discussion section. And in the discussion section, the authors will begin by summarizing their results. So a lot of times you can get a lot of what happened in the results by reading the discussion section. Also in the discussion section, they'll put the results in the context of the research that's gone before it. So they, um, they'll they talk about like consistent with so-and-so-and-so, -and -so -and -so, we found blah, 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 blah inconsistent with past research by blah, 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 blah. We did not find blah, blah, blah. In fact, we found blah, blah, blah. Does that make sense? So the discussion section begins by summarizing the research and I mean the statistics and uh, the results basically and putting in the context of um, what came before it. Then there'll be a whole part of the discussion section where the authors will lay out limitations of the research problems, um, you know, with confounding variables, problems um, of why you might not be able to generalize to other um, populations other than uh, uh, to other samples or other people. Um, they're going to really do a good job of talking about all of the shortcomings of the study that they ran, because there's no perfect study, as we'll talk about next week. And so all the studies have advantages and disadvantages. Toward the end of the discussion section is where the authors lay out all of the disadvantages of the method that they used. And then the end of the discussion section, they'll oftentimes talk about what researchers still should do. What should happen next? Now that we know this, what should happen in the future? And then will come the reference section of the paper where they'll give the reference of every pay of every author that they cited so that if you want to go back and look at that article, you'll you're able you will be able to. OK, so all of the articles that you're going to read, they're going to follow this APA format. So what do I want when you go to summarize these? Well, at the very beginning, I need for you to put the reference. I don't need the full APA reference, just the author's last names in the year it was published. Under this summarized prior research slash theories presented in the paper, I do not want a summary of the abstract. So often students in this section give me a summary of the abstract. I don't want that at all. The abstract summarizes the research that this entire paper did. It gives you like a big overview. It lets you know whether you want to read the paper for most of us. Um, now, in, for this course, you have to read it. So, but what I'm looking for here is for you to summarize the literature review that's presented in their introduction section. So I don't need like a list of authors, but what I am looking for here is you've read what's happened before. I want you to summarize it. Now, some students do it in bullet points. They're like, so-and-so and so-and-so found this and created a theory about it. You don't have, you, you can go into as much detail as you think will help you to be able to answer multiple choice test questions on um, on the exams. For you, the final exam is um, applying this work to um, a real world question of interest. So how much information do you need in that section that will help you to possibly apply this to another, uh, apply this paper or the results of this paper to a question a real world question. So I want enough detail in there so that I know you understood the main points in the introduction section, but also enough detail in there for you so that it'll save you time when you go to study. Then I need the purpose of the paper. So this can be one sentence. The purpose of the study was to blank. Does that kind of make sense? 
In an ideal world, you're not going to find the sentence and cut and paste it in here. You're going to put it in your own words. But sometimes it's so succinct and so perfect that basically what you end up writing here is very similar to what the authors wrote, and that's okay. Some of the articles that you're going to read will have more than one study. One of them, I think, has like 12, but um, most of them have two or three. So um, you're going to put down the hypothesis for study one. So what are they expecting to have happen? Then you're going to briefly describe the method section. So um, the participants in the study, what did they ask them to do? Does that kind of make sense? You can, again, put as much detail in here as you want so that you don't have to go back and reread the paper when you go to study for the, mid, for the unit one exam or the unit two exam. Um, but also enough de but you uh, and enough details so that I know that you understood the main things that went on. But it doesn't have to be super long if you're like, I got what happened. If I write this, I'll remember it. So you're going to do a brief description of the method. When I first started writing these brief descriptions of the methods, the way I did it is I pretended that I was trying to um, describe what happened in the study to my 15-year-old um, daughter. Does that kind of make sense? Or um, to my mother or to my husband. So like if I were to tell the story of this study, what did they have people do? My daughter, my 15 year old daughter doesn't want like every little detail, like how many participants there were or what was the name of the scale. Um, she just wants to know the facts. They had college students complete a survey that measured self-esteem and then they blah, 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 blah. So that's your brief description of the method. Then you're going to identify the independent variables. And next week, um, if you haven't had a research methods class yet, or and you didn't major in psychology undergraduate, next week we're going to, um, in the research methods lecture, I talk about independent variables and dependent variables and how to identify them. And so... Um, uh, you, if you don't have a research background, you might have to wait till next week to come back and do this week. Um, but what you're going to do here is um, identify the independent variables. In addition to saying what the independent variable is, I need you to give me the levels of the independent variable. So uh, sex, male or female, age, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, or five-year-olds, treatment, they either um, got the stimulus or they didn't. Um, whatever it is, you need to give me what the independent verbal is and then tell me the groups, tell me the levels of the independent verbal. Then you're going to state what the dependent verbal is. You don't need to tell me how it was measured or anything. You can just say weight. You don't have to say in pounds. <clears throat> you can say self-esteem. You don't have to say they use the Rosenberg um, self-esteem scale. You can just tell me like basically what the dependent verbals are. Then you're going to talk about the results for study one. In this section, I never want statistics brought up. I don't want to know the T, the R, the F. I don't want to know means. I don't want to know standard deviations. I want you to talk about the results, again, as though you're telling a story to your mother or your husband or your very intelligent 15-year-old daughter. So they did the study where they did this, and they found the three-year-olds did much better at this than the four-year-olds, but they weren't as specific. So like, you're going to give me the gist of what they found without any statistics, okay? Now, if there's a second study, then you'll give me the hypothesis for study two, the brief description of the method for study two, the independent variables with the levels for study two, the dependent variables for study two, the results of study two. If there's a third study, then you'll do the hypothesis for study three, description of study three methods, the independent variables for study three, the dependent variables for study three, the results for study three. After you've gone through all the individual studies, and if there's only one study, then you'll just do one. Then you're going to write this section, conclusion, that basically means what do we know now that we didn't know before? So this is sort of like bottom line, what does this all mean? Why is this important? What is it that we now know? Okay. And it's really like this shouldn't be more than a paragraph. And sometimes it's only going to be a couple sentences. 
Then I'd like you to discuss the limitations of the study. You can talk about some of the things that the authors brought up in the discussion section, but also like be creative and come up with some of your own. This is your chance to show me what a great researcher you are, that you're able to identify some of the potential confounding variables, some of the limits to generaliza generalizability, some of the issues that you see. And then last, what does this all mean to your life? How is the how are these findings relevant to you? Okay. And that like it, you probably don't need more than a paragraph there, maybe even just a couple sentences. Some students go, this really relies to my relates to my life. And they go into a big long story, which is great, but you don't have to do that. You just do the amount that you think makes sense to you. Okay. So what I'd like you to do now is to read, there's an article here that's on self-referencing and it's very short. I've, it's old, but it's short. And I found the shortest article that I could because I want you to do this for practice. So I want you to read the very short article. If we were meeting face to face, I actually pass the article out and people read it during class because it won't take you that long, like about 45 minutes because it is so short. And then I ask people to fill out the empirical article um, template that I just went through. And then we discuss it together. Now, because we're not meeting face to face, so we can't discuss it together, I've included a link with the key. So when I went to review it, this is the type of thing I would write down. And so I really want you to go through this process. I, um, I know if I were taking this online class, I would right now probably skim the article, not write down what each of the things are, just go, that's what I would talk about. And then look at the key to see how close I am. And unfortunately, if you don't have a big research background, I'm afraid doing that is gonna really make your article summaries harder to do. So I know the next hour and a half of uh, reading the article thoroughly, not just skimming it and writing out the template and then really looking at the key to see where you went right and where you went wrong uh, may seem like, oh, that's a waste of time. But I really don't think it is. I think in the long run, it will save you time when you go to um, summarize the articles that you're going to have to summarize for real. Okay. If you have any questions at all, please email me at marydz at cameron.edu. And after you read this article, you're going to find out why the last section of the empirical research articles, I say, how is this relevant to your life? Because you're going to see when you read the article that things that we make relevant to our lives, we remember better, longer without even trying to. And the cool thing about teaching advanced social psychology is almost all of this relates to your life. Um, I also enjoy teaching statistics, but it's really hard to make the statistics relevant to people's lives. Uh, social psychology, it just is. Um, th there's not even one article that we're going to read here where it is not going to relate to your life in some way. So it's kind of a neat exercise for you to do, and it will help you remember it. All right. I'll see you next week. Bye.